Hello there and welcome back to this lecture series on bilingualism. This is the second video in which we'll talk about bilingual speech perception and comprehension. So in this video I'll talk about a few experiments that are described in more detail in chapter 2 of Grosjean and Lee's The Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism. If you don't have the book, don't worry, you'll be able to follow this video, but if you want to read up on the details of these experiments or if you want to take a look at the references, get a copy of the book, it's all in there. Okay, so in the last video I talked about some of the benefits that bilinguals have, cognitive benefits, but there is more. So there's one thing that I want to show you. Uh, as a bilingual, you have the privilege of being able to appreciate the not-so-subtle humor in advertisements like this one here. So this is an advertisement for a beer that is actually on sale in supermarkets in Germany and elsewhere. And uh, why am I showing you this? Well, I guess the reason is more or less obvious, but actually, well, <laughs> This beer is brewed in a village that is its namesake and also the second part of the name is actually quite innocent. It just means uh, light in color. Yeah, so this name is actually not what you would have thought uh, it is. But still, if you are doing your groceries in a German supermarket as a speaker of German and you see this on the shelf, you cannot help but get a little kick out of that. Yeah, so um, if you're as simple-minded as I am, I think this is hilarious and I just can't help reading this as English rather than as what it presumably is intended to be. Okay, uh, this actually brings us to the main idea of this video, namely the idea of how bilinguals manage their different languages when they're processing language. Um, in the book, Grosjean distinguishes between monolingual mode and bilingual mode. I already talked a little bit about this in the last video. And uh, there are different questions that we can ask with regard to these two different modes. So when bilinguals process monolingual speech, as you are presumably doing right now, um, does it work like speech processing in monolinguals who only have this one language? Or uh, is it actually more complex than that? So does the other language come in at some point or other? Then once we go to bilingual mode, when bilinguals process bilingual speech with code switches and borrowings, how does that work? Yeah? How do bilinguals manage their different languages that they have at their disposal? How do they decide whether to process something as this language or that language? That's something that we'll talk about in this video. Now, here's, to start with, a very simple model of what goes on when you process language. In the middle, there is a box that represents your mind slash brain. And in your mind, you have linguistic knowledge, that is knowledge of words, syntax, and other aspects of language, pronunciation, etc., etc. Uh, and at the same time, there are a number of processing mechanisms, such as phoneme recognition, word recognition, syntactic parsing, semantic interpretation, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> uh, we actually know a lot about these individual processes that happen when you convert an acoustic signal into some sort of idea in your mind. Uh, but we will need to talk about how this works in bilinguals. Okay. One thing you see in this graph is that there are two arrows moving toward your, your mind or brain, uh, one coming from the top and one coming from the bottom. So these two are meant to represent bottom-up information flow and top-down information flow, and we briefly need to talk about these two. Bottom-up information flow is the processing of very basic, low-level information that you turn into something more complex. So you see the little squiggly wavy bit at the bottom of the slide, that's supposed to be a sound wave. And uh, those are acoustic features, a yeah, physical phenomenon that uh, represents low-level, very basic kinds of information. 
<clears throat> now in speech processing you take this basic kind of information and turn it into something more complex namely a word that has an idea and a part of speech and collocational preferences and so on and so forth um, okay that's bottom-up information flow top-down information flow uh, starts with something that is very very complex and goes to something that is slightly more low level so you can imagine how uh, something in the speech situation in the context makes you hear a certain bit of sound as a different word than what the speaker actually intended yeah so that is top-down information flow that that influences how your mind handles low-level information. Let me give an example of how this might work in practice. Um, so let's say that you're sitting in a car next to your friend and you don't think anything in particular for a moment and then your friend suddenly says, it's green. Yeah? What happens? What do you understand when your friend says, it's green? Well, uh, on the one hand, there's bottom-up information flow, so you parse the sound it's green into the words it's green yeah but at the same time there's also uh, top-down information flow so that uh, let's say you look outside and you see that there's a traffic light that was red just a moment ago now it's green and so you interpret your friend's intention as uh, telling you see the traffic light has changed we need to get on yeah we need to move all right so that's an example of bottom-up information and top-down information working together in speech perception that's very much the normal process of understanding language right now let's uh, get bilingualism into the picture how does this work in bilinguals um, presumably we need two boxes with different processing mechanisms and linguistic knowledge to account for the fact that bilinguals actually have more than just one language that they're dealing with. Um, this is what Grosjean presents in the book and I've annotated this graph to explain in some more detail what is meant uh, by this diagram. So <clears throat> Grosjean distinguishes between two modes of understanding speech uh, and he terms these non-selective and selective language processing. Non-selective language processing would be the idea that the speech that you hear is available as input for basically all of the languages that you know. Yeah? So even though uh, right now <clears throat> your English may be more active than one or two of your other languages. The other languages would never be fully switched off, so to speak, but they would always be on a sort of standby, yeah? so that the words that you hear are in principle available for being processed with those other languages in mind. Now, the contrasting idea to this would be selective language processing, uh, which would correspond to this idea of having a switch in your brain that allows you to selectively switch on one language and switch off the others so that the stuff that you hear at any given moment is only going towards the language that it actually instantiates. Yeah? Um, I can tell you already now that Grosjean is, is very critical of this idea of selective language processing and actually uh, will see whether there's evidence, experimental evidence, for non-selective processing in bilinguals even when just one language is there in the input. So we'll see several examples of that. <clears throat> okay, coming to the first example, uh, there's a, a methodology that is frequently used to find out more about language processing um, and that method is eye tracking, which many of you probably know. Uh, so eye tracking, the basic idea is that you record people's eye movements as they inspect some kind of visual stimulus at a computer screen. <clears throat> and uh, language comes into the picture when you have people do that relative to some kind of linguistic stimulus. Yeah? So you have them look at a picture, give them some language and see how that changes where people look on the picture. One uh, 
typical kind of experiment that you see done uh, quite a lot goes by the name of visual world paradigm. So the visual world paradigm is a kind of experiment where you have a display with several pictures on the screen, so three or four as you have here, and relative to that, a linguistic stimulus. So in this example that you see here on the slide, you have four pictures, a peach, a beetle, a lock, and a beach. And relative to that, you have the linguistic auditory stimulus click on the beach. So you're asking people to pick out one picture from the set. And of course, the, the target, the right answer, that's the, the, the beach on the bottom right. However, you notice that the other pictures have been chosen with uh, some thought in mind, with a hidden agenda. Namely, there's a peach, which sounds a lot like beach, except for the onset. Yeah, so the rhyme in peach and beach is the same. And there is another competitor, namely a beetle, which uh, starts in the same way that beach does. Okay, and the question is, when you have people look at this at random, they probably, I don't know, they, they look at all four pictures more or less randomly, but as soon as you hear click on the beach, you're likely to focus on the target picture. Or are you? Yeah, so maybe you also look at words that sound more or less like uh, beach. And in, indeed, this is what you find. So this would be a, a typical uh, result that you get. So let's say that the word beach is uttered at the 500 millisecond mark. Shortly after that, most people go to the target and click on that. So we have most uh, fixations actually going towards beach, but also the cohort competitor, beetle, and the rhyme competitor, peach, they get more looks than the unrelated uh, lock picture. Yeah, so that's the general idea, visual world paradigm, and this can be exploited to find out interesting stuff about bilingual speech processing. So here's an example, a study by Spivey and Marion, uh, who studied Russian English bilinguals and gave them a display like this with several pictures. And here the, the twist to the methodology was that the participants had to click on one picture and move it somewhere else on the display. So in this case, um, they got a uh, stimulus, hear me butcher Russian, Polui Marku Krestika, put the stamp below the cross and the task, you can do this with your own mouse if you like, it won't work, but you can try, um, click on the stamp and then move it under the cross. Okay, now when you consider that these were Russian English bilinguals, you um, well, you, you could have an idea of what this experiment actually was about. So if you want to think about this for a little while, pause the video here, make a bunch of notes, brainstorm a little bit, and then come back. I will go on now. So the obvious twist here is that the word Marku sounds suspiciously like an English word marker, and there's a picture of a marker. And so this might be a very powerful distractor, a very powerful competitor uh, that the participants might look at. Yeah? So there's no a priori reason for us to think that uh, this English word should influence the uh, bilinguals. But if language processing is indeed non-selective, then we might suspect that having a picture of a marker might actually detract people just a little bit. Yeah? So the question is, does the presence of a marker distract the Russian speakers, Russian English bilinguals, in their task of moving the marku? Yeah? <clears throat> there was another control condition where the fourth picture was not a competitor of this kind. So a control object like a ruler uh, has, has no phonological similarity uh, with Marku. Yeah? Okay, so basic question, are the Russians distracted by the marker but not by the ruler? Uh, the results show that uh, there's a 
great asymmetry, so lots of distractive potential with the marker, but not as much distractive potential with the ruler. So this is the first piece of evidence that points towards the non-selective nature of bilingual language processing. Okay, so um, this suggests that even in monolingual settings, the other language or the other languages are never really fully deactivated. There's not this switch that completely kills uh, the other language. And uh, very subtle, very weak uh, cues, like phonological cues like Mark, can immediately activate the other language. Uh, so that's evidence against selective processing and also evidence against two mental lexicons that are completely separate and uh, are, are mutually um, disactivated when you use the other. Okay. Now, <clears throat> is this an all or nothing thing or can the activation of the other language be reduced to some extent? Um, in order to find out about this, uh, Chambers and Cook ran another visual world paradigm study where uh, this time French-English bilinguals participated and the linguistic stimuli were in French. So here we have four pictures and uh, <clears throat> the participants had to click on a relevant picture. And the linguistic stimuli that went with it were things like Marie va décrire la poule. Yeah? Uh, those of you who don't know French, la poule, that's the chicken. But you notice that there's also a pool, a swimming pool, right? And so the swimming pool would be expected to be a distractor for French-English bilinguals. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, this experiment actually came in two versions where uh, the stimuli, the linguistic stimuli, were created such that uh, one type was more restrictive than the other one. So the restrictive context stimuli were sentences like Marie va nourrir la poule. Okay, um, so in the first condition, décrire la poule, describe the chicken, well, you can describe anything. Yeah, you can describe the swimming pool just as well as a chicken. <clears throat> nourrir, that means feed. You can feed a chicken. Yeah? So, in fact, the chicken is the only thing that you can feed on this display. Uh, but a swimming pool, certainly you cannot. Yeah? You, you can't feed a swimming pool unless you're a very metaphorically minded person. In that case, you probably shouldn't experiment, uh, participate in experiments like this. Okay, um, so what came out? Are the bilinguals distracted by the swimming pool in the same way across these two conditions? or? would the restrictive context somehow inhibit the um, distraction that we get with the pool. <clears throat> Here we see the results. So the gray bars, those are the non-restrictive contexts where the stimuli had general verbs like uh, décrire, uh, describe, yeah, you can describe anything, and the black bars are the restrictive contexts where you have things like nourrir, uh, feed, there are only so many things that you can feed. And you see that the looks to the competitor objects are uh, more frequent in the non-restrictive context. So in other words, um, <clears throat> sentence context can minimize activity in the other language. When we have a verb that is very, very specific about its object, then we uh, tend to be very focused on that object and not consider other competitors. All right, <clears throat> so that means it's not an all or nothing issue, but rather um, it's something that is gradual. Yeah? You can be more or less focused on one language. Languages can be more or less active when you're engaging in natural speech usage. Okay. <clears throat> Right. Um, now, aside from these momentary effects uh, that are being studied in these uh, visual world experiments, uh, there are also more permanent influences of the languages that bilinguals have at their disposal. And I want to take a moment to talk about those. 
So the one type of permanent influence is influence in phonemic perception. That is the way you understand words as being composed of phonemic units. Right. So here you may be influenced by the sound categories that you have acquired as part of your upbringing in a dominant language. So the sound categories of a dominant language may have an influence on how the sounds of a non-dominant language are perceived. An example from that for that is in English we have a phonemic contrast between a and e. Yeah, so sat, uh, I just sat there. Uh, sat is a different word than set. Yeah, you can have a TV set um, or something else. So a and e, different sounds. You find minimal pairs with those minimal uh, with those uh, different phonemes. And other languages don't have that phonemic contrast. So Dutch, for instance, doesn't. German doesn't either. Um, and uh, there are languages such as Catalan and Spanish um, where we have similar contrasts. So in Catalan there is a phonemic contrast between e and e. So uh, again, <laughs> I hope there are not too many uh, speakers of Catalan who... well anyway I'm not going to read this. So there is a difference between neta and neta. I'm doing this awfully. Yeah. Uh, so these two are different words. And uh, Spanish only has the e, but not the e. Yeah? So that raises the question, how do speakers who are bilingual in Catalan and Spanish hear a word such as neta? Yeah? As some kind of instance of neta or as a different word? That's the basic question. Um, so here a study was done not with um, eye tracking, but rather with a different experimental paradigm, namely a lexical decision task, which also used priming, a special case of priming, namely repetition priming. Um, let me unpack this and talk a bit about, first of all, what a lexical decision task is, then what a lexical decision task with priming is, and then what a lexical decision task with repetition priming is, and what this finally, um, how, how this was turned into an experiment with Spanish Catalan bilinguals. So a lexical decision task, quite basically, is a task where you have to say as quickly as possible whether something is or is not a real word in a given language such as English. Yeah? So as a participant in the lexical decision task, you would be in front of a computer screen, you have two buttons, one that says true, another that says false, and if something is presented that is a real word of English, you press true. And if you get something that is a non-word, you press false. Uh, let's do this real quick. Uh, bird, that is a real word of English, so you press true. Uh, apple, true. Snorkel, false. Yeah. Um, glit, extremely false. Yeah, that's not a word of English. Um, that is basically what a lexical decision task uh, does. Now. There are also lexical decision tasks that incorporate priming. <clears throat> and uh, cross-modal priming is a kind of priming where you see a picture that sort of evokes the idea that is expressed in a word. So in a lexical decision task with cross-modal priming, you would see a picture displayed on a screen, and after the picture you see a word, and for each word you have to decide as quickly as possible, is that a real word of English? Yes or no. Uh, so here you have a picture of some yogurt uh, and you see snorkel and so you say no that's not a real word of English. False. Here we see uh, yeah, some, some part of a car and we get apple. Yes that's a real word. Here we see a bee and then we get honey and because a bee is semantically related to honey uh, people would be slightly faster to press yes in this kind of condition. Yeah? So the picture primes honey through the semantic association. Yeah? That's the idea behind that. Now repetition priming. That is a different kind of priming that's arguably even simpler than this uh, uh, semantic priming through a picture. Um, <clears throat> now in repetition priming you see the same word several times 
And that obviously gives you an advantage in deciding whether or not that word is a real word or not. So you'd see non-words like this, false, true, true, false, true. Okay, and uh, you notice that the word pen appeared twice. So <clears throat> at, when you see this the second time, it has been primed, and so you should be faster to recognize it as a real word than the first time that you saw it. Okay, back to the uh, bilinguals. <clears throat> um, so in this experiment, the researchers used a lexical decision task with repetition priming, and the participants were two groups of Spanish-Catalan bilinguals, namely one group uh, which had um, Spanish as their dominant language and another group that had Catalan as their dominant language. And the critical stimuli were minimal pairs with e and with e. Yeah? So like neta and nete. Um, that is the same word, save for this little difference in the two uh, e and e sounds. Now, the question is, when you have heard nete, are you then quicker to react to nete? Yeah? All that you have to do is to say, is this a real word? Yeah. And let's say you have heard the first, are you then quicker to say, yes, the second, that's also a word? That's the question. Um, here are the results for the uh, two groups. <clears throat> and uh, you see results for e the exact same words. Yeah. And you see results for minimal pairs that have this e -e contrast. Um, <clears throat> there are two sets of results. Uh, to the left, we have the speakers who are dominant in Catalan. And to the right, we have bilinguals who are dominant in Spanish. And you see that there is a difference between the two groups. Yeah. So, And the difference uh, does not concern the words that are exactly the same but the difference concerns the words that form minimal pairs. So what goes on is that um, there's a priming effect so that people are faster to react to the same word if they've heard it before. Yeah? So uh, for nada and nada, <clears throat> both the Catalan dominant uh, bilinguals and the Spanish dominant bilinguals, they're faster when they hear it the second time around by some, yeah, between 60 and 80 milliseconds. Yeah, nice effect. Now, um, let's look at the Spanish dominant bilinguals. They have basically the same kind of effect for neta and neta. Yeah, so for them, this means actually that this is kind of the same word. Yeah? If I'm primed with neta, I am very quick to react to neta. Yeah? So for them, it actually sounds the same. It is the same. They're primed by one and react to the other very, very quickly. For the Catalan dominant speakers, that effect isn't there. Yeah? So they um, don't show a facilitation effect for minimal pairs of this kind because in Catalan there is this phonemic difference between e and e. All right, yeah. Um, another experiment <clears throat> has been done by Guillemont and Grosjean on English-French bilinguals. And here uh, there were different groups, namely early bilinguals who were bilingual from five years onward and late bilinguals who acquired their other language later in life. And um, this task here was not so much on comprehension, on, on processing, but rather on production. Uh, so these participants were asked to repeat phrases such as uh, le petit bateau, yeah, the little boat. <clears throat> there was a recorded voice reading this out and the participants just had to produce the same words uh, which were then recorded. And the question here in this experiment was, does it take people longer to repeat phrases in which some grammatical errors were engineered. Yeah? So does it take people longer to repeat phrases where the wrong article appears? So 
Uh, Guillermo and Grosjean also recorded phrases like la petit bateau. Now, bateau is uh, of male uh, grammatical gender in French, so la petit bateau. That doesn't work, and uh, petit, that's also the wrong form, so this doesn't make sense for a speaker of French. But still, I mean, you can produce that string of sound. Yeah, That's not a problem. The only difference is that for a speaker who knows French, they know that ah, this is wrong. This is not how you do it. Okay, so is there a difference in how fast people are able to repeat this? Uh, interestingly, the answer is yes. Okay, so here we have the results. Um, three groups, monolinguals, they were the control group, then early bilinguals and late bilinguals. And you see uh, black bars and uh, sort of checkered bars, and they represent the neutral kind of stimuli, something that actually exists in French, and then the incorrect condition where people had to produce something that is grammatically not correct. And the crucial difference in this graph is between the early bilinguals and the late bilinguals. So you see that the late bilinguals actually have the same response times for the neutral stimuli and the incorrect stimuli. Yeah? You give them something like la petit bateau and they produce that just like that. Yeah? Le petit bateau, la petit bateau doesn't make any difference. For the early bilinguals there is a striking difference. Namely, they are somehow a bit reluctant to produce the incorrect phrase. Yeah? And so they have longer latencies for la petit bateau than for le petit bateau. And uh, interestingly, this, this lines up with the behavior of monolinguals. Also, monolinguals um, have longer latencies when you ask them to produce something that's grammatically incorrect. Okay. Now, <clears throat> uh, this shows that for, for, for monolinguals and early bilinguals, there are strong effects of congruency, incongruency, and late bilinguals have no effect of this kind. So they have the same reaction time for both conditions, and that means that gender marking, this grammatical indication of word class, uh, is not processed in the same way as in monolinguals and early bilinguals. Okay, um, some more aspects of processing bilingual speech. The chapter talks about something that is called the base language effect. So when you use language as a bilingual, typically there will be one language that is more firmly rooted in the situation, yeah? the language that you're currently speaking, and there are other languages that may come into play. The language that you're currently using, that is the base language, and the other languages that come in, <clears throat> uh, we could call them guest languages or incoming languages. Now. A base language effect would be that the base language is processed with greater ease than the incoming language. So a question that we can ask is, are words from the switch language or the guest language processed more slowly or with more effort when they come in? Yeah. <clears throat> Let's look at this. Um, Grandjean did an experiment already in 1984 with English Portuguese bilinguals and a uh, design that he used was to uh, have a lexical decision task that is sort of embedded in an actual sentence. So the task would be to listen to a sentence and in that sentence find a word that begins with a certain sound such as a K and then perform lexical decision on that word. Yeah? So here's a sentence you listen to it word by word, look for the word that starts in K, and once you have it, decide whether that is a real word or not. And uh, this kind of design was presented in two conditions, namely a monolingual condition. Um, so a sentence with only English words. After lunch, the children asked for a piece of cake for dessert. Yeah, so here we have a word starting with a K, and it is a real word of English. Now the question is, does this work in the same way when we have the word cake appearing as a code switch? Yeah? 
<clears throat> so I've already butchered Russian and Catalan in this video, so I won't do you the favor of going on with Portuguese. Um, you see that this is a Portuguese sentence where uh, several English words crop up, yeah? and one of them starts with K, so that's the one that the participants had to decide on whether or not it is a real word. And um, what came out in this experiment is that code-switched words actually resulted in longer latencies. So it takes people longer to decide whether something is a word when this word comes in from uh, a language that is not the current base language. That's the base language effect. Okay, another uh, experiment that, that sort of uh, tries to get at the same thing um, <clears throat> has been has been undertaken by uh, uh, Dominietti and Caldonato in 1999 using French Italian bilinguals and here uh, the task was to again listen to a sentence and then repeat the second word from a list uh, again, we have a monolingual condition um, where people heard a French sentence such as uh, J'ai entendu les mots aéroport, grenouille, sapin, collier. Yeah? And <clears throat> that means I've heard the words airport, frog, uh, pine tree, and uh, collier. The, the, the collier is collier, right? Um, don't ask me jewelry questions. Yeah, I, I'm hopeless. Um, Okay, or does it mean like a necklace or something? I mean, that's jewelry nonetheless. Anyway, um, the basic point is you have a list of words and you're supposed to repeat the second one. So the correct answer here would be grenouille, frog. Yeah? In the bilingual condition, <clears throat> you would hear the same sentence, but this time the second word is actually a code switch. Chena, yeah? <clears throat> And uh, also in this experiment, the code switched word takes longer to repeat. So again, that's evidence uh, for the idea that there's a base language that is currently in use and that is easy to process. And when the other language comes in, there is a temporary higher effort to process that language, base language effect. Okay, um, <clears throat> another issue that we need to talk about is how bilinguals even recognize that code switches are happening. Yeah? How do you realize that a uh, sentence that you're currently hearing continues with a word that really belongs to a different language? That is somehow not trivial. Yeah? How do you, um, you have to be on your toes mentally to decide that, oh, this word actually belongs to a different language. All right, I've prepared a little something here for, for this issue, so let me make this large. Um, and here I want to introduce another experimental technique, one that actually has been developed by François Grosjean. And this technique is called the gating task. Um, in a gating task, uh, people have to guess the word. Yeah? So your task here will be to guess the word uh, the critical word is presented in segments of increasing duration. So there's a carrier phrase and a critical word, and you have to guess that critical word. And um, not only have you got to guess the word, you also have to decide whether that word is English or French. And you see I have prepared a sequence of sounds here that I'm going to play to you in sequence and uh, the sounds will reveal segments of increasing length of the critical word, okay? We'll do this, and you have to guess the word, and if you recognize it at stage three, you're a genius, and, um, well, after that, it gets increasingly easier. Okay, let's go. He was eating an... Uh-huh. He was eating an... eating an eye. Ah, sorry. He was eating an ice. He was eating an ice. 
He was eating an ice cream. He was eating an ice cream. Okay. So, uh, in the end, it was quite clear that, okay, here... He was eating an ice cream. The word, the critical word is ice cream, and ice cream, of course, is an English word. But in the middle... He was eating an ice cream. Yeah, okay, you hear ice, but um, you're probably confident that this is an English word, and you're guessing it's ice cream. Um, but... Well, it's a difficult task, really. Let's do this another time with a different trial. He was eating an. Oh. He was eating an. Hmm. He was eating an. I have no idea. He was eating an. Hmm. He was eating an. Ah. He was eating an. He was eating an. Okay. 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 So you get the general idea of how this works and you hear increasing segments of a word and you have to figure out whether it's one language or the other and you also give some kind of indication of how confident you are right now what are some of the findings that emerge from gating tasks um, things that have been established is that words that have language specific phonotactics that is sound combinations that only occur in one given language. They are recognized as code switches earlier than uh, words that are phonologically possible in both languages. Yeah? So uh, if we think of a word such as uh, slash, words that have an SL onset are simply not there in French. And so you can relatively quickly decide that, okay, this is not French, this is something else. Um, other words are phonologically possible in both languages. So take a word such as pick. Yeah? In French, you have peak. And uh, so <clears throat> the onset, that would be legal. It's possible. And so these are harder to distinguish and are distinguished later than uh, these language-specific words. Um, okay. Also, words that occur in only one language are recognized faster than words that occur as homophones in both languages. So homophones, words that sound the same, yes, the phonetics is subtly different, but still, um, words like English not, yeah, like the thing that you tie, and uh, French not, the kind, the kind of grade that you get or um, sound that you play on an instrument, they sound rather the same, yeah. So they have they share enough material to be really difficult to distinguish, and so these homophones are tough cases for speakers to to deal with when they're looking at code switches. Right. We'll talk more about homophones in later sections of this course. Okay. Now, how do we make sense? Of all of this. In the book, uh, Grosjean outlines a model of um, bilingual uh, language processing and uh, word recognition. And it works something like this. You see again those arrows with bottom-up information flow and further up in the model there's top-down information flow. And uh, the way to read this would be actually from bottom up to the top, so it starts with some kind of acoustic wave, you hear speech, and from that speech you extract uh, features, that is phonetic features that are determined by how much air comes out of my mouth, is there friction, are there stops, you know these low-level acoustic characteristics that you distill into phonetic features that are then classified as phonemes in the middle of the model. So you classify the sound as a language-specific phoneme and uh, this actually already leads you to anticipate further phonemes that are coming up. Yeah? So as soon as you get from the feature phase to the phonemes phase, uh, you see that there's a division of language A and language B. And once you have identified a phoneme as belonging to language A, you have certain expectations about what other phonemes may follow. Yeah? So English has different phonotactics than French, and so uh, this will lead to different expectations. Now, 
After that, you get to the word stage, in which you anticipate how a string of phonemes adds up to a word, and here your expectation may actually influence what kind of phonemes you hear. So that's the top-down arrow. Yeah? If you've identified the first half of a word and you're almost sure that, okay, you'll say ice cream, yeah? uh, it doesn't really matter what the last part of the word sounds like because there's so much top-down activation of the word ice cream that uh, yeah, uh, this strongly influences your um, perception of the respective phonemes. And of course, from further higher up, uh, there is what Grosjean here calls higher linguistic information or contextual information that will have an influence on what kinds of words you expect in a given context. All right, uh, summing up then, <clears throat> um, what have we seen about bilingual speech perception and comprehension? Well, um, I've uh, talked about different types of evidence for non-selective processing, the idea that the speech signal is there in principle for all of the languages that you know. Yeah? Both or all of your languages are active when you hear speech as a bilingual, um, but these languages are active to different degrees. Yeah? So context can reduce the activation of a language. <clears throat> And uh, we've seen that there's this base language effect, which suggests that there is an asymmetry with how active uh, the respective languages are. Um, we've also seen that the sound categories and grammatical categories of a dominant language influence how a non-dominant language is processed. We've seen that code switching incurs a little processing cost, yeah, the, the base language effect. And we see that code switches are actually most difficult when the elements that are switched are phonologically similar to the base language, that is, when they're homophones or when they're at least legal in both languages. All right, in the next video, we'll move on from language comprehension, language processing, to bilingual, uh, bilingual language production. Until then, uh, au revoir, see you then and uh, have fun. Bye.